this uh, short seminar. Uh, we want to spend some time with you and tell you how to perform science fairs on the middle school and on high school level also. First of all, can, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, so I, I, I'm not sure how many of you were here last Wednesday. There was a seminar here last Wednesday also about physics. So if you were here, raise your hand again. So none of you were here. Oh, I'm sorry. So there's a large community here. I think last Wednesday was probably more, uh, a bit doubly packed than this room here. And we were here to talk about uh, basically introductory physics courses uh, offered for kids who have no background in calculus yet. So a lot of people think when you want to do physics, you, you should have uh, uh, a calculus as your background. It's not really true. So we actually did uh, some uh, demonstration here uh, last week. And, uh, but tonight we're going to do something different. We're going to tell you how to uh, do science fair projects. Right? And um, let me introduce myself to everyone. I think I should stand away from the lights because this is really, really bright as well. For those of you who do not know anything about a Casio projector, what's so special about a Casio projector compared to other projectors? Casio is the first company who makes a um, projector using laser lighting. So this is actually a laser projector. So it's really, really not some, something you want to stare into. Trust me on that. Right? So I'm going to move away from the lights off before the whole line. Uh, I guess you may sit down. I'm sorry? You may sit down and then... Maybe you sit down. Oh, yeah, sit down please. When I do presentation, I usually stand up, that's why. Yeah, right, okay. So this is so, a yeah. Of mine. So my name is Thank You, Thank You Liu, Grand Slide Thank You. Very easy to remember. All right. I came from Hong Kong, so the names are kind of strange. In, in case you don't speak Cantonese. All right. A bit on my background also. Uh, I, I earned my PhD and Master, both from uh, UC Santa Barbara. For those of you who do not know, uh, Santa Barbara keeps a very good soil state program uh, on laser diodes, on, um, on high-speed transistors, things like that. My advice is Andrew Hoppe, so for those of you who know him, he won the Nobel Prize in the year 2000 in physics, actually. Right? So uh, I, sort of, I do know something about physics, actually, in general. All right? And I came from Hong Kong, so I got a lecture from Hong Kong University also. Right? And uh, I haven't done this for a long time already, but I used to be session chairman for various semiconductor conferences, uh, including uh, device physics and also something called molecular beam epitaxy. I seriously doubt if anyone know what molecular beam epitaxy is, so I'm not going to detail about that kind of technology. Right? Uh, I, I hold some US patents and European patents also. I co author some technical papers in a previous life. And uh, I used to work in a place called Hughes Research Laboratories. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Malibu, California. Have you been there? Raise your hand. Some of you do, right? And uh, I, I like to call Hughes Research Lab an Iron Man lab. Do you know why? How many of you have watched a movie called the Iron Man? Of course you have, right? What's so special about that movie relate, in relationship to uh, Malibu or, or to Hughes Research Lab? Do you remember the bad boy of the movie, Tony Stark? He graduated from MIT or something like that. <coughs> remember the like, like, glass dome structure? That is actually a computer model of Hughes Research Lab. Right? So we call Hughes Research Lab the uh, Iron Man lab. It's a true place, it's a real place you can visit in Malibu, actually. Uh, but last, uh, last decade or so, I, I, I actually developed interest in software. And these days I'm working as a consultant for Oracle. Uh, but mainly I'm on a uh, sometimes part time, sometimes uh, full time basis. So I also work on something called application servers. And uh, I'm, I'm basically an instructor in the Oracle University on Java technology. That's not the reason why we're here. So I, I want to tell you I also do tutoring on the side. I do math classes all the way from algebra one all the way to differential equations. I also do physics tutoring. Uh, everything from maybe order physics all the way to AP physics to math contests also like that equals MA. And I do Java programming training. And tonight uh, I'm going to talk about science fair. So 
Right? Specifically, you notice that I mentioned something called Arduino, and I mentioned something called IoT, Internet of Things also. And I don't know how many of you play with uh, Arduino. If you do, raise your hand. Well, so some of you know what Arduino is, right? It's something that came from Italy, and that's not food, it's something related to technology. Now, if they want to tell me why I mentioned about Arduino, right? it's an excellent platform for you to do science fair, actually. Right? You know why in uh, maybe half an hour right? So we're really here to talk about college admissions. All right? uh, it's very tough to get into uh, colleges these days. And um, for example, next year, in year uh, 2018, uh, in case you do not know, uh, there's a bump in the population for the high school kids going to college because year 2000 is the year of the dragon. So the first year of the millennium. So people love to have kids that year. So that's actually extra 10%, believe it or not of high school kids going to college next year. And so I feel sorry for you if your kid is in 11th grade right now. Because <laughs> next year they have to worry about the college admissions and all that. Right? Now if you can look at college admissions, there are concepts called hoax and unhoax. Right? So this is what gets you into a college. Right? Now first of all, I have a disclaimer here. I'm not a college counselor. But I do know a general concept of getting into college. Right? So we'll tell you what hoax are. And what are the are? You probably don't have a lot of those hooks here. That's okay. I want you to do science scale projects to get, give yourself a better chance to get into colleges. All right. So first of all, I want to tell you what are the are. Hooks are what gets you into a college, right? Uh, first of all, are you legacy? Do you have legacy to go to college? Are your parents undergraduate or do, do your parents graduate in an undergraduate program of those good universities? That's considered legacy. Right. Uh, maybe you are a sports star and you have coaches going after you to try to get you into their, their program or something like that. Or maybe you have a lot of musical talent. Maybe you are the first violinist in San, San Francisco Symphony or maybe you are the uh, concert master. That's a different ball game altogether. We are not here to talk about that kind of uh, hoax. Right. Maybe, uh, I don't think, no, I think none of us here are ULM, underrepresented minority. I'm sorry, we are not well there. That helps though. It helps a lot, usually. All right? And if you like tech schools like MIT or Caltech, are you a girl? That makes a lot of difference. All right? You can easily get a factor of two to three boost if you go to Caltech or MIT being a girl, actually. It's just the way it is. Sorry. If you're a boy, I'm sorry. <laughs> in fact, Asian males in STEM are sometimes known as the endangered species. Or the tank schools actually, because they, they, they find it more and more difficult to go to MIT and Caltech altogether. Right? Uh, sometimes it helps also if your parents are professors at Stanford. It makes a world difference, trust me, on that. Right? Unfortunately, my parents are not professors in Stanford also. Right? And finally, can you donate a building? <laughs> that will make some difference too. They talk about 10 million plus donation to those colleges. Those are the hopes. If you look at all hopes, good for you. All right? And uh, I, I'm not sure you, you want, but most of us, well, at least half of us are uh, unhooks actually. They actually makes it even more difficult for us to get it, all right? So if I really want to go to the best colleges, how can I improve my odds? All right, so uh, now please understand this is, I'm talking about the extreme case. You want to go to HYPMSC, the six top most colleges, all right? So in general, we don't really aim for those colleges. But should you want to, I will tell you what they look at in general. All right? But even for top colleges in general, these are good suggestions that you should follow. All right? First of all, get a really good GPA and standard test results. All right? So uh, these days, we look at something like 1560 as a preferred value, over 1600, if you want to go to the really top most TV top colleges. All right? And you want to get glowing teacher's recommendation letters. You know, some lukewarm letters and all that. Yeah, you also want to take the most competitive classes in your school, particularly in relation to your classmates. Because you know what, when the college admission officers look at your application, they compare among yourselves within the same school, actually the first thing you look at. Right? And also, uh, if, you want, if there's a college you really want to go to, you really might want to apply either early decision or EA to boost your chances of going there. I won't go to the statistics, I'm not that like that. This is not like a, a talk about college admissions, because I want to give, give you the reasons why you want to do uh, science fairs and you want to do it early. You know the reason why later. All right. 
Finally, uh, well, for, for yourself, something you can work on. For example, you can always win some awards in national contests. The big five are math, physics, chemistry, biology, and programming. Right? Among them, the most prestigious is math contests. So some of you may be familiar with USERMO or USAGMO co contests and all that. Unfortunately, they are extremely difficult to get to that level. Statistically, there's only less than half a percent of people attending math contests that attains the uh, USERMO or USAGMO level. That seems awfully difficult. All right? The rest of the four national contests are a lot easier. Usually, they are 10, 20, 30 times easier compared to math contests. And correspondingly, they're also less prestigious compared to that. Now, a lot of people fall into the trap. They think, that's all I need. Let me go to USERMO, USAGMO, and heck, maybe I can go to more awesome. I go to one of the 60 students to go to the summer school in, in, the, national, in the national camp and all that. Hey, maybe I even get to the, uh, uh, the final four, four or five students to go to uh, the, um, the uh, IMO level and all that. Actually, it does not make a lot of difference. Once you reach national level from a college admission perspective, they're almost the same. They actually look for you as an overall this complete person. So it, it does not make a lot of sense if you really have to struggle to get to the last national level. It's good enough if you can go to national level already. But some of us do not like the stress going to do user mode or user code or the user's all kind of contents. Right? It's very, very, very stressful and all that. But you can, in, the, in that area, you can also do research. Now research is a lot different. Because when you do research, you don't have the timing pressure. You don't have to answer like six problems in nine hours like in, in the user mode contents and user mode contents and all that. Your whole year, therefore, you just have to work hard on it. In fact, most college admissions consider research more valuable compared to your three hours performance in a, in a particular context. Does that make sense? Right. So you might, you almost want to do research as an alternative to give you a boost in terms of college admission. Right. So here I mentioned about some peer review research publications. That's the extreme. That means to submit the research result to a publication. And those are peer-reviewed publications, very prestigious, but this is okay. Even if you don't publish it for so peer-reviewed journals, still good enough. A lot of times it's good to read some kind of a valuable research in, 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 your, in your high school years. However, you don't, uh, you know that the, 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 your performance in middle school does not count towards college admission. But you don't just go to high school, suddenly start reading all the contests, doing all the research. It's a very good time for you to prepare for, for research if you start in the middle school ages. That's the, that's the opinion that we have. Right. And finally, probably the most important thing in college admission is actually to, to have your outstanding essays. Particularly when it comes down to maybe Ivy League colleges and all that. If you look at statistics, if you reach the useful, useful level, you are almost assuring to MIT and Caltech. Statistically, it tells you 90% of students that reach national level and math contest already get into MIT already. However, that's not good enough for you to go to Harvard or Stanford. If you look at statistics, only 30% of those students still go to Harvard or Stanford. So they want something more than just your three hour or six hours performance in a contest result. Right? So tonight I want to show, I want to tell you what uh, science fair contests are there and how you can achieve that level of uh, performance. Right? And you'll be surprised relatively how easy it is to win for some, for example, Siemens competition or maybe go to what we call the general STS contest also. If you look at statistics, you almost have a 16 to 20 percent chance of winning a contest if you do science fair. I'll, I'll tell you why that's a reason in, 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 during this presentation. First of all, I want to introduce everyone uh, something called the uh, Siemens competition. Right? Uh, Siemens competition, of course, first in the junior year, uh, excuse me, in the senior year of a high school student. So this, you still have time to win this contest and then put the result of this into your college application, even though you apply for early ED, <coughs> ED or DA admission to a application for a particular college. Um, <coughs> the reason is that this contest takes place. Uh, you shall run September or October time frame. The result came out in November, before the deadline for the EA or the EA for those colleges. Right? Uh, <coughs> a little bit about the history of Siemens uh, competition. 
Uh, Siemens actually purchased Westinghouse in 1997, but they did not purchase the right to hold the uh, most famous uh, uh, Westinghouse contest. So Siemens got annoyed, so they decided we're going to create their own contest. This is what this is the origin of the Siemens contest. Actually, originally the Siemens competition is actually a means of a college ball up to 2013. And subsequently, they asked a different organization called Discover Education to administer such a contest. It's only open to uh, high school students in this country, so it's not considered an in international contest. This contest is a national level science fair contest. And um, uh, they're usually senior, but they do allow team projects. If you are performing a team contest, you might be able to sneak in and perform this competition earlier than your senior year. So that's one trick you might want to do. If you know some uh, high junior, a senior doing uh, maybe science fair and submitting a, a project to Siemens competition, you might want to join them. Or, or, is, or convince them you should join their team so that you can get the name into the competition also. That, that seems to be a trick. And uh, in Siemens competition is good enough already to win a semi-finalist. And, um, and uh, there will be around 300 candidates that elected to be semi-finalists out of roughly about 1,600 uh, submissions on it. It's very easy. It the odds are almost 40%. It remains a mystery why so few seniors submit a research result to the Siemens competition. Rumor is that seniors are so busy, they were just spending the time in September, October, dying to finish the essays, they have no time to do research, all right? So that's, that's good. So if you have time, if you have this thing, if you have this kind of preparation, I have time, you should actually, because chances are very high that you're going to enter the, uh, as, as a, uh, as a semi-final section. Uh, beyond semi-finalists, there's also a level called the finalists when you will be asked to go to one of the six test centers, uh, depending on your geographical regions. In this area, you go to Caltech to do your finalist uh, competition. But you don't really need to reach that level. Being a semi-finalist is a great honor. It's a game changer already in your college admissions process. Right? Anyway, the six uh, partner universities are MIT, Georgia Tech, Caltech, uh, Texas, uh, uh, Notre Dame, and also Carnegie Mellon. Right? So for us, uh, you, you have to go to, uh, it sounds like a torch, you have to go to uh, Caltech to do your final uh, competition. All right. I think these days they allow you to do video conferencing. You actually do a uh, web access on it and you present your, your, your results and all that. The nice thing here, I want to tell you before I lose my thoughts, you only need to write your research finding as a paper. You don't need to prepare a poster, you don't need to prepare a talk and all that in order for you to win a semi-finals in a Siemens competition, right? So in the, imagine in, in, uh, the fact here, uh, you submit a research report to a Siemens competition. It's a blind reading. It's very fair. They don't want to know because your research came from MIT, I'm going to give you a award. They don't want to do that. When you write a research report, you are not supposed to tell them in any shape and form where do you do your research, how do you get this result. They don't want it. They don't want to. In fact, I think you might be disqualified if you indicate where you do your research. Actually, All right. And anyway, like I mentioned, 1,600 entries on average. 300 of them received the uh, the semi-finalist status. This is very easy in comparison to other contests. Uh, the rest is more for, more for finalists. Like I mentioned, they, they, they will select 30 individuals, 30 team uh, uh, finalists, and then they'll go to one of those six universities where, where they defend basically. It's almost like a, a very serious competition where they select the, uh, I think finally they select six individuals and 16 projects, one presenter, they fly into Washington DC. Who, uh, who knows what they do, how they torture in Washington DC. Right? <laughs> All right, so this is the first contest. Like I said, very easy to win. For some reason, very few seniors seem to get the, how important it is to attend the uh, Siemens uh, competition. The second one is the famous STS. Now, most of you come to understand this known as the Intel STS contest. 
Well, not Intel anymore. Intel decided not to sponsor this science fair anymore, which I totally do not understand why they want to give up the prestige of not sponsoring this particular contest. Uh, starting in year 2017, it's actually with General who is uh, sponsoring this contest. It's called Science Talent Search. Uh, it has, this is the country's Super Bowl of Science, the nation's oldest and most prestigious science fair uh, contest. And it originated back in 1942. In those days, believe it or not, there's a company called Westinghouse. And uh, they, they sponsored such a contest for almost 60 years until they passed the responsibility to Intel in the late 90s. And then in 2017, we general, a, I think a biotech company on the East Coast is now sponsoring that particular project. Right? And this is a very prestigious science uh, fair contest. If you look at historically, I think eight of them, the five semi-finalists, went on to receive the Nobel Prizes. Uh, two of them earned the Fields Medal Prizes, basically the Nobel Prize in, math, in Mathematics. Uh, five have been awarded the National Medal of Science, etc. You can read the, the, the awards, the honors here, actually. Okay, this is a very prestigious uh, science fair contest. And for some unknown reason, again, I do not see a lot of seniors apply for this contest also. In fact, the odds are almost the same as Siemens. Uh, you typically have something about 1,800 papers, and this is about 300 to be the semi-finals. I think these days, uh, we generally call them a, a, a national scholars. You change the, the terminology and all the same thing. All right? You have about 16 to 20% chance to win this contest. All right? In fact, in this area, in you know, the area, the Bay Area, uh, some high schools, the private school alike, they are, they are very active. And I don't know what school you come from, so I, I thought I'll, I'll bring out a little list for those uh, schools that are participating in both Siemens contests and the general STS that will show you the, uh, the results. Hackers are very famous in this area. I think they have the science fair classes and all that. They really help the students to do the research and all that. You can look at historically hackers, it's kind of famous in the country to be generating and creating uh, STS uh, semi-finals in this area. But not too bad for our public schools also. All right? uh, specifically, uh, Limbro and also Monte Vista seem to be very interested in asking the students to apply to the regional STS also. Now, I do understand why some seniors do not want to go to regional or STS uh, contest. The reason is that this is not really a science fair contest. This is really a miniature college application. Not only do you submit your research paper, you also have to give them your GPA, your test results, teacher's recommendation. It's actually a college application. So when they award you a, a, uh, some award, basically you have been admitted to some fictitious colleges, some fictitious or prestigious university already. Right, so that's, maybe that's the reason why not a lot of seniors want to be kind of disappointed and, and apply for, for regenerative STS. Right? Right. But the biggest one, science fair for, for uh, maybe a high school uh, uh, kids to go to, are not necessarily seniors, it's of course the ISAF. ISAF is the most important one, the largest one. This is an international science fair contest. Right? And um, usually, um, well, I, I was explain the process, uh, you actually have to be qualified first before you go to ISAF. Unlike Siemens and the general STS, both of them you can just go. You are a senior, you can just apply. But Intel or ISAF requires you to be pre-qualified first. You have to be the champion of a local science fair contest first, which brings up an interesting question. So in our area, which is the local science fair that I should attend so, so I'm qualified to go to ISAF? I don't know where you came from, but if you live in, the, um, in this area, that would be the synopsis science fair. So that's why later on you spend, you notice I spent some time telling you how to win the synopsis science fair. All right. So anyway, uh, this is considered the uh, inter international science fair contest, and it's the, uh, it takes the world's largest contest. If you win, uh, like the synopsis grand prize, and you are qualified to go to ISAF, they actually pay for everything for flying there to attend such a contest. Then you see international contest winners, you exchange pins and all that, you, 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 you make, make friends there and all that. And these are really such an excellent opportunity for you to kind of, to kind of network with all these 
kind of piece around the, around the world, actually. Right? And I think uh, this year, the, uh, uh, in May, uh, they, they will have the ISAF uh, held in uh, Los Angeles. So they change cities and all that. Usually, in, in, in this country, I believe that some time ago, a few years ago, they had the ISAF held in Canada. But usually, it was North America. I won't go for all the details, but right, I just want to tell you uh, this is sort of like an ultimate that you can achieve if you do science fair. But remember, the reason why I'm talking about science fair is that I want to tell you you want to make your college admission application look really impressive. A winning contest like math contest and physics might be a bit difficult because of the pressure and the timing and all that. Science fair is different. The odds are higher. You also have the whole year planned out for you to do science fair. Projects. Right. I'm going to detail about how, how nice the prices are and all that I said, so I, uh, I, I will skip all this. So I, I want to tell you, in, in, uh, in, or at least in California, or in this area, the qualified local science fairs that qualifies to go to ISAP in this area will be synopsis. So um, I think it, it happened already in the uh, end of uh, March. And uh, there, they, I remember, they select about 10 projects. So these are the 10 projects representing the Bay Area to go to uh, Los Angeles from ISAF sometime in May. All right? But it's not just synopsis. If you live maybe up north here, I think there's a San Francisco Bay Area Science Fair, San Mateo is one. Those are also qualifying science fairs for you to go to ISAF course. And, uh, and now this is the new rule in California, all right? So normally, in the last few decades or so, to go to ISAF, you have to win your local science fair contest, which qualifies you as a champion of that science fair, then you can go to ISAF. But starting this year, I believe that they change the rules. Sometimes you, you kind of, uh, you win the first prize in a category in your synopsis science fair. And historically, that only allows you to go to state-level science fair. So you go to USC, University of Southern California, uh, to attend the highest level of a state-level science fair contest called CSSF, California State Science Fair, which I think happened yesterday. All right, so this year, my kid did not attend, so I know, but I know it was yesterday when, when they have the CSSF in, uh, in USC. Or in like in the museum down in, in Los Angeles also. Right? Now, there's a new rule now. If you win the CSSF in the state level science fair, now they give you some slots. They can then promote you to ISAF also. So this is a new path. So in the past, if you, if you uh, win the first place here in St. Boxes, that means you go to CSSF in English, you did not go to ISAF. But now you can, because you have to win the ISAF, uh, the, grand prize first before you, they send you to ISAF in the past, but not anymore. Now they give you a second chance. You can go to CSSF and win something. Then using that project, you can still go to ISAF. Right. Seems to be a new rule in, uh, in ISAF. I don't know why. Right. Anyway, I just want to tell you, uh, Synopsis Championship was held uh, earlier this year, <coughs> and you're aware of it. Right. Right. I'll go to all the details. <coughs> One thing I really want to encourage you to attend the synopsis science fair here in the Bay Area is that they are, it's actually very easy to win prizes in the uh, synopsis science fair. They call it synopsis science and technology championship. In fact, I think up to 30% of projects submitted or to, 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 to go to the uh, synopsis, uh, synopsis science fair uh, won some prizes, one way or the other. All right. For example, um, uh, they have prices from individual categories, maybe physics, maybe engineering, maybe uh, bioinformatics, uh, maybe math, etc. And uh, they have what they call category prices. Also, industry will send the representatives there, uh, professional societies will send the, uh, the members there, and they give you what they call the uh, special awards also. It's quite easy to win, win prices. If you do really well, like I said, you can also go to CSSF, State Level Contest, or might, you might be able to even go to ISAF altogether. Right? And this does not apply just to high school students. I want to tell you, the prices start at middle school level already. Right? So in fact, that's the reason why I want to bring up synopsis. 
You want to use it as a training ground for you. And you want to start early, preferably in middle school years. And that hones your skills so that when, once you go to ninth grade or beyond, you're now ready to, to actually try to attempt the more serious science fair contest. So I won't go into details and all. Just to mention that if you win the grand prize as a middle schoolers, uh, usually they don't they still don't send you to ISAP, but you can attend an alternative called the Broadcom Masters Competition. Something may be familiar with the Broadcom contest. That's that's sort of like the grand prize for middle schoolers. Right? But for the grand prize for the high schoolers, we of course be the uh, the ISAP. Right? So this is sort of like the the roadmap of high school science fair contest and all that, right? So to me, uh, if you win Siemens, uh, even kind of in general STS or ISAF, uh, that is a game changer when it comes down to your college admissions. Actually. I won't go for all the, all the details, right? So I want to uh, I tell you also, uh, California State Science Fair is considered California State's highest level, most prestigious science fair. Again, like I said, you have to be qualified and be recommended by a local science fair contest before you can even attempt such a science fair contest. Right? Usually held in the California Museum of Science and Industry, next to USC. Uh, in fact, it's usually recommended you go to such a contest, stay in the hotel. Don't wander around in the USC area. You know, it might, might not be the safest area in the Los Angeles. So go there. Attend, uh, attend the contest in the evening to walk around off the campus or something like that. Uh, that's my humble opinion because I see I want to see your kids in the future. Awesome. Uh, kind of very interesting. Uh, and like I said, the, uh, the contest uh, ended yesterday on April the 25th. Uh, so. Alright. So you um, so for the rest of this I want to tell you more details about how do they judge your contest. And, uh, and how do you get some ideas about what contest you want to do? And I want to bring up some uh, winning contests. I want to tell you what, what has been, been winning topics or, or, or projects in those science fairs. So you have some idea what, how much effort you might want to spend on this and how you might want to be able to win something in such contests. Right? So uh, basically, they look at two kinds of projects. One is what, what you call a science experiment. So you do physics or chemistry or biology kind of experiments. They're, they're, remember this is a research. So you're not supposed to know the results. They don't want you to do any demonstrations or things you, or, or things you know the results already. That's not what they want to look at. Right? So usually they want you to have some idea. And I'm, I'm going to show you some ideas, how people kind of come up with some ideas, how they, how they perform the uh, actual experiment too. Right? So uh, judges are usually given some kind of rubric. They will look at some kind of rubric and they, they, they kind of rate your project. They give you marks. And then they, using that, they, they come up with the, the honorable mentions, the second place, the first place, the grand prize winner, and that kind of stuff. So uh, they, they like your, your, thought, your, your scientific thought to be original. They want something to be new. Right? But they also want you to have some reasons to do something. Uh, later on, I'm going to show you a water filtering project. So water filtering, water purification is a common project. And I, I actually recommend custom, uh, kids, if you're young, think about something along the line of water filtering. Very easy to do, but you want a reason as to why you're doing something as a filter. Right? So for, for example, later on, I'm going to show you a project, and the project uses something very special called um, a kaito sun. Kaito sun is the some kind of chemical that you can extract out of the shells of crab, shrimps, etc. And there are reasons why the project uses that as a reason as a, to stop the effectiveness of filtering water using something like that. You want a reason, you want a motivation as to why you do something like that. Right? I've seen other filtering projects, and some kids will say, well, I'll try to filter water using banana peel. I'll try to use filter using onion skin. Why? There's no reasons, no motivations. I want to do that. You want some rationale as to why you take some approach. Right? So they want the project to be creative. They also um, uh, uh, here I, I read, I, I kind of highlight something in red here. A lot of people do not know that when you do research, it's very important for you to keep a notebook. 
for the given time. You want to keep a notebook. Well, I came from a research environment. Remember, I came from Hughes Research Lab. It's extremely important when you do research, and I mean serious research. You keep a notebook, you date it, you write up everything that you do, including silly mistakes that you make. Right? If you don't like something you do, you don't tear off that page and throw it away. That's not how you do research. You have records of everything. Particularly, now it might actually happen to your project. Later on, you want to file a patent on your research work. I'm actually aware of projects that's done on a high school level, and subsequently the project actually is used to apply for US patents also. It's absolutely possible. Make sense, right? But you have to make sure you do everything right. You don't talk about results, don't publish it, don't give a presentation about results before you apply patents. That's it. That's public knowledge. That's too late already. All right? So there are some cons constraints, some restrictions that you have to do before you, if, you, if, you are, if you're serious about the research. All right? So a lot of students do not know you have to, you're supposed to keep a project notebook. They make it explicit as part of the research project also. In fact, when you go to CSSF, when you go to the um, Synopsis Science Fair, they actually give you a day to prepare for your poster. So you put your poster there, you make sure everything's ready, you set up your board and all that. They also ask you to leave your notebook there. I hope you have a notebook when you do your research. All right? And uh, also they will look for your technical skills. You know what you're doing. Right, you know how to use instruments, you know how to build your instrumentation and things like that. This is for science kind of an experiments project. Now some of us do not do science experiments. Some of us do an engineering project. Right, for example, you know, uh, for example, people might be uh, disadvantages. Maybe I have uh, Parkinson's disease and all that. Sometimes my hand shakes a lot and all that. So you might want to design something to help them stabilize your spoon, have this a really nice project to work on. Right? Those are not concerns like science experiments. Those are actually a scientific public, some kind of engineering project. So they judge your project differently. Right? So uh, here I laid down some of the uh, hi I highlight some of the pointers. This is what how they use to judge your project. They want one thing they want to look at are the elements of redesign or retest. Is it an easy project? Think about something, decide it's already done. They don't like it. Have an easy project. Has that been your, your redesign efforts? You learn something from your first mistakes. Maybe you're making a coil gun. I'm not talking about rail gun, those, uh, those army projects where they fight a, a pro me metallic projectile and who knows what energy level and all that. I'm talking about coil gun, electromagnetic gun. Maybe the first time you build it, it's kind of slow, you don't know how many currents to drive, the corner and all that. Ah, once I learn, the criteria, the, the, the conditions of, on, on which I should improve on project, I will throw away my previous design stuff all over again. They want, they like that. They want to look for redesign evidence of redesign and then retest of your engineering project. Right? Other, other than that, again, they still assume you have to have a, a novel approach and then you keep a nice uh, project notebook also. Right. And uh, for example, in a uh, in synopsis, you're guaranteed two judges to go to your, your poster and, uh, and, and in, in synopsis, and I think it also applies to other local science fairs also, they actually uh, separate uh, the projects into two categories. So I want to tell you something called RRI and non-RRI projects. RRI stands for uh, Register Research Institute, aka do you work, are you working with a university? or a research institute, right? Because that gives the students a certain level of advantage, right? So if you are able to join Stanford University and work on some STEM cell research, you have an advantage over the rest of us who work with the high school teachers or set up some lab in your garage and all that. So they actually, they kind of raise them separately. So when you submit your project, you tell us, are you doing an RRI project or are you doing a non-RRI project? So the, this evening I want to introduce to you how you can do non RRI project. If you want to do it on your own, you get some help from your high school teacher, or maybe you don't even get your help from your high school teacher. How do you start doing science fair projects in middle schools? So that most of my talks subsequently will be all a non RRI project. Although I will tell you a little bit hints and discussion about what RRI projects, how you can get started also in the end. However, when it comes down to ISAF, 
They don't care. All high school projects are considered at the same time. So category uh, awards are provided for RLI and non-RLI separately, but they merge all the projects together because well, that's it. They, they have to give out the ISAP or the, the grant price uh, qualification to ISAP projects, then they don't care. So that, that is a disadvantage if you're not under the, the help of systems or, 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 or uh, with, with a university. Right. And I won't go into detail about all the top things that you can perform. Right? So typically, if you want to know science, there are a lot of criteria. The first thing you want to do, you want to know what, what, what am I going to study. That turns out to be the most difficult step. What am I going to do? All right. So um, I don't know how, how much your, your, your middle school uh, kids or your high school kids are, what they are reading, what to look at. I usually recommend that, that if they use a cell phone, so they use a cell phone all the time, right? ask them to go to use an application like Flipboard. So you know what Flipboard is? It's a self-made magazine. It's an application for Flipboard. And you basically subscribe to science categories. There's a category of science and all that. So they, they send you all these news about science on a daily basis. Lots of news and all. That's how you get ideas, right? Then you know, oh, I don't realize that the whole world is talking about uh, uh, carbon nanotubes. They're talking about graphemes. So well, how do I do research on graphemes and carbon nanotubes? But how do I? Go to eBay. You can buy carbon nanotubes, you can buy graphene. Does it make sense? All right. So I have to know what topics are important, what topics are useful. All right. So I always such if you if you're in CS or math, you may you may or may not know. Deep learning is everything. You probably should think about doing deep learning projects, right? And later on, I'm going to talk about things like this, what kind of how to develop your concepts and all that. Right? But the point is that you need to be aware of what is happening around us. All right? And if you're into engineering, you, you may or may not know IoT is very hot, Internet of Things, which instead of human to machine communication, we're not talking about machine to machine communications. Right? So it's like the internet for the machines. That's what we call Internet of Things. It's a nice engineering project. But you won't know this unless you are in touch with the industry. All right? So uh, uh, you write down any ideas that you have, no matter how ludicrous it, it might be. All right? I'll tell you, typically when you work on science fair projects, you have so many ideas which are great, except that you cannot do that. I have no idea. You have no resources to do that. I know I can cure cancer. If you only give me the CRISPR technology, let me, let me modify your DNA, but I, I don't have things to modify DNA in my garage, right? So sometimes, a lot of times, you have the common ideas, but you notice that you have to throw most of your ideas away anyway, right? Once you get some ideas, you look around. Do I have, do I have a chance to get those equipment that I need, right? You'll be surprised. In your, in your high school, a lot of times, they do have the equipment. Thank you. It's just that you never ask. You never ask your kids to ask the high school chemistry or physics teacher what kind of equipment you may have in the internet. So step number one, pick a winnable project. You can leverage on it. You, you know you, 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 this is a nice idea and I think I can do it. Uh, this, is a, this is a bit tricky. It's a winnable project means I think I can do it, but you, you want to take some risk. It's not too simple. So I know I can do it. It's so simple. It's not going to win. All right. And uh, also make sure it's not been done already. At least not in exactly the same way that you're trying to do. All right. For example, some of you might be interested, oh, I want to make some solar cells. I heard there's a, something called DSSC, dye-sensitized solar cell. <coughs> That's really easy. A layer of titanium dioxide, bake it on the oven, put some kind of a kind of juice, maybe raspberry juice or grape juice and all that. I can put them together and I can, wow, develop a solar cell. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people have done that already. Now, if you want to do that project, and I don't want to discourage you, make sure that you are not doing exactly the same thing that people have done before. You have to have an angle which is different from the earlier projects, right? So maybe, no, I'm not going to use raspberry. I think I'm going to extract chlorophyll out of a leaf, and I'm going to apply chlorophyll instead of the, the, the uh, whatever chemical people have been using. Make sense, all right. So sometimes you want to look at the same problem because you know it will work. 
but I want to look at it from a different angle of the game. That's the trick. Right? So first thing you do, look at earlier projects, particularly those projects that have won before. So I'm going to give you a new angle as to how you solve this problem. Right? And I, I like this comment here, and in fact, uh, this is sort of a sad comment here. If anyone is you, you better not share a project with anyone outside of that. All right? uh, look, bad thing is that plagiarism and still like is not uncommon. In this case, very competitive also. And step number two, yeah, now that I've nailed down what project I have to work on, so how do you approach that problem? Now, in the synopsis science fair, they actually ask you to fill out a form. You tell us, you actually have to tell them what your approach is. What are they looking for? They don't want you to be doing something dangerous or explosive or you have to kill an animal or something like that. All right? So they will all my father is my uh, test candidate. I'm going to see if he's going to survive under these physical conditions and all that. They don't like that. No human test subjects in, in the science fair context. All right? and, um, so in fact, they will ask you what are your dependent variables or the independent variables. You actually have to give them a rough idea what you're going to perform in the science fair. But don't worry, it's changeable. You can change it. Right? But, uh, and what they're really looking for, are you going to do something dangerous? Or are you going to use methanol? Are you going to do salt like extractor in your garage? A glass where might explode. They don't want that. All right? Are you going to use high voltages? Are you going to use a cap as the size of a, of a cylinder or something like that? Because I need to do my coil gun. They don't like that. They worry you might die in the process. Trust me, science fair is important, not that important. Right? So they don't want anything dangerous all the time. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, if your school sport have a participating te uh, teacher in synopsis, you are not, as a parent, you are not allowed to sponsor your own kids' project. Then you have to go through the school to sponsor your project. So uh, I always tell people, um, uh, uh, you, all, you always want to look around to make sure that you can leverage on what you have mostly to perform your project. So I, I put out a lot of websites here, and uh, this is really for, 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 the, for the class I want to talk about, because I think Spring Mind wants to offer a class for kids to get started on uh, middle school science fairs. And the project is physics based, and uh, we're going to use some components and all that. And I find Find out that online, they say, uh, by the way, I'm not familiar with this company, I just want to tell you. If you want to buy electronics boards, sensors, and all for your physics space science fair projects, uh, it's very easy to go to a place called banggood.com. It's not like, a, it's like an Asian online website and all that. They have all the parts you want when you want to build your science fair projects. Right? And later I'll tell you what Arduino boards are. I think if I mentioned this already. For those of you who do not know what Arduino is, this is actually a concept that came from Italy about 10 years ago. All right? So Arduino is not a microcontroller board only. It's a single board computer, so it contains the, uh, the, the processor unit, memory, everything. They, they make it very easy for you to interface with something. You can interface with a like, temperature sensor, you can interface with an IMU unit, uh, an integrated ocean unit. Uh, you can also integrate it. It's really easy for you to measure data and all that. Now, why do you want to use a computer to collect data for you? Because it makes your life a lot easier to handle. Right? Some projects you really want to collect lots of data. When I say lots of data, I mean tens of thousands of data points. You will hate yourself. If you do a project, you force yourself to sit down there and measure data and write down a notebook only to have a few out of a new spreadsheet and then do calculations and all that later. You might want to automate the whole process. That's the reason why I want to introduce to you the concept of Arduino boards. Now, uh, some, some of you may not be familiar with Arduino boards, but you might have heard of something called the, um, the Raspberry Pi. All right. So, have you heard of Raspberry Pi before? Raise your hand if you do. You guys don't play a lot of toys these days, huh? <laughs> Raspberry Pi did not come from Italy. It came from the UK. All right? It's as part of the education program in the United Kingdom. They designed a special uh, board. It's again a single board computer. Only that is higher level than Arduino. They allow you to run a whole Linux operating system on that board. It's a wonderful toy. 
All right, if you or your, your kid does, if birthday is coming up, find them a, a Raspberry Pi. They will learn a bit of Linux, they will learn a bit of Python programming. All right. But um, uh, later on, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think uh, in, in, the, in this class, uh, they, in, in Spring Line, we want to offer a class and, and tell people how to do science fairs. But the, I think the first time, I, I think uh, we're going to use Arduino mode. It's easy and it's uh, easy to learn. And I think you know, uh, there are places for you to buy chemicals if you're into chemistry related projects. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now I have a comment here, on step three here. Your actual study. Now uh, this is not my comment, so if you are not happy with my comments here, I apologize. But this is a written comment from um, from uh, Nikola Tesla. Uh, for some of you may not know, uh, I think Tesla and Edison did not really get along. Uh, it's no secret there. And in fact, uh, in fact, I'm going to read what Tesla wrote about Edison. Everyone knows Edison is like the, the greatest and best inventor author ever or, or planet Earth or something. It's not quite the case according to Tesla. So let me read a little comment from Tesla then, all right? Upon uh, Edison's death, Tesla published a following about uh, Edison. Uh, first of all, I think I think there's some kind of personal kind of uh, vendetta against him among the details about someone's personal hygiene or something like that. That's not the point here. But he, 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 he did mention that Edison's method is inefficient in the extreme. Because Edison usually do not do any physics, physical or chemical or any calculation at all. He just do it. He just do the experiment. All right? And this is not the way you should. All right? In fact, for example, I think uh, Edison was well known for his invention of the phonograph and also DC motor and all that. But one of the things that he invented, which most people know, uh, is the, uh, the light bulb. And uh, he actually literally tried thousands of materials. He initially didn't even have a vacuum, he just do it. <laughs> he would pass a current and you burn the filament one after the other. And uh, later on he realized he maybe he need a vacuum, later on maybe I should change the material, the metal and all that. And, uh, and Tesla said that knowing that just a little theory, a little calculation will save him. 90% of the labor, and I want you to do the same thing. All right, you don't just put force and try blind luck in your so-called science fair research. Right, you need the rationale. You need to do some back of, back of the envelope calculation before you come to the conclusion how you want to approach a particular science fair project. Right? By the way, one more time, this is not my opinion. This is actually Tesla's opinion uh, on on the right? All right. Uh, but I, I want to uh, make sure, sometimes kids are really great, because I think really like it. But let me remind you one more time, that's not everything, all right? You should not die for it, nor should your GP suffer because you're doing science with that project, all right? So don't compromise your GP. There's no reason for you to ignore schoolwork and all that. Uh, and so you, you do, and you do have to keep a good sort of like uh, schedule. You have to have good time management when it comes down to adding science fair to your to your uh, very busy schedule in uh, high school and university. And last but not the least is slide presentation also. But I find this a bit uh, uh, difficult for some kids. Uh, remember this is a synopsis science fair. Kids have to make a speech and present the result to but for a lot of kids, they are shy. They don't want to do, they won't want to make a public speech, but you have to. They start out with a slide presentation. Right? Also, uh, I've seen a lot of projects, and uh, the students do not understand that you are not supposed to write your essay or your poster. <coughs> your essays are supposed to be graphs, charts, data, not like a, an essay article. It's very difficult to read a poster. And you lose the interest on the judges. If you are writing a post as if you write a long essay, a lot of students make that mistake. All right? Use bullet points. And then put your uh, poster into the, uh, different sections. Let me see if I have all the sections here. The introduction, question you're going to answer, hypothesis, you're going to science uh, research, your background, assuming you've done some background here, materials, the procedures, results, conclusion, future work. You don't want to be writing a long essay in terms of your different you know, models. Sorry, I jumped a few slides and then go back to some of these slides. So, um, 
team. Uh, I want you to collect as many data points as possible to give more kind of a co co confidence on yourself to come to certain scientific uh, research uh, conclusion. Right? And I put this in red markers here. Data points go to the lab notebook. Graphs go to the post. You don't want someone to stare at your post trying to figure out what earth have you done? What are you to those numbers in and all that? You are supposed to present the data in a nice graph to show people the progression or the dependency on certain uh, independent variables. Yeah. And uh, I, like I mentioned one more time, no blocks of text. You don't want to be writing a long essay, fonts, chalks, or something like that on your post. I've seen that. And um, but those are details. Right? And finally, maybe a speech also. A lot of kids also do not know you have to prepare two speeches, not one. All right? The first one is what I call a one minute elevator speech. You know what a one minute elevator speech is? You go to an elevator, you realize that you are the same elevator as the CEO of your company. Now you're one minute before the elevator goes to run to make your pitch about a project you want to, your company to work on. That's your one minute speech. We call it one minute elevator speech. Right? Now why do you need to make a one minute elevator speech on your science fair project? Because most people who go to your poster, they are not the judges. They don't want to spend 20 minutes with you. They just want to know what to work on, can tell me the results. If they are interested, they stay. If they are not interested, they politely say thank you very much, and they move on to the next poster. Right? So you want to have a very brief and to the point description of your project. I call it one minute elevator speech. Right? But the judges do come in, <coughs> and you need a 10 minute detailed technical presentation also. So you need to typically two presentations also. Right? And uh, it makes a world difference whether you prep for your speech before or, or not. So you should ask students to prepare your speech in front of a mirror. So make your speech a day or two days before your science day contest and prepare the speech also. Right. So I thought I'd bring in some uh, winning contests for you and so you guys don't want to be winning and all that. There are so many topics. So I thought I'll focus something on something that everyone can understand. The first one I want to bring in is on water quality. I realize that a lot of Projects is related to water quality, all right? So uh, in fact, I, I like this. In fact, this this uh, this uh, entry called Water Quality in Silicon Valley was the first award, and uh, it was uh, promoted to Ice Week, which is an environmental science kind of uh, science fair. It was also qualified for CSS Cup. And it looks like someone is designing a, some kind of a water desalinator, so they remove the salt in the drinking water, and uh, this. Sounds like an interesting project, probably a more like an engineering project. And someone is looks like another engineering project, they want to improve the efficiency of a parabolic reflector, that means they want to collect the sunlight and focus on a single focal point. And uh, somehow they, they are looks like they're doing some desalination also on the seawater. They are more, right? Now this is an IoT project. They need to do an internet enabled shower usage monitor as a nudge engine. So you, you don't take your shower for too long, you're wasting water. Right? An interesting project. It's a middle school project. How do I know? Because it won the first place in the category, was promoted to Broadcoms of Masters, <coughs> not to ISAF. So this is actually a grand prize in middle school. Right? So apparently they do IoT. That means they someone someone's watching your, your water usage when you take a shower. Not someone, I should say a machine. It's not that scary. A machine is watching your water usage. Hey, you are taking a shower for too long. Somehow they they want to shame you into stopping your shower. I, guess. I don't know how it works. Right? And uh, uh, this is all, all always nice. Uh, a low cost, eco friendly water filtration system. And I think the title says it all. For third world countries, they love it. You do something like this, they love the, the application of this kind of project also. Right? I don't know the details here. Uh, looks like only one second honorable mention. That's good enough. For then maybe the uh, first time if you uh, attend such a contest. Uh, 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 so there are some other uh, water related. Now I want to show you something about this particular contest too. Uh, this is my kids project uh, a few years ago. And uh, he was young. Uh, he didn't know physics yet. So he wanted to do something 
So I thought, oh, maybe you should do a chemistry project. So in those days, we studied engineering projects before. I said, maybe you should do a water fusion project. Right? So now my, my kid actually did not watch TV for the first 12 years of his life. I live in a very strange family. My wife said, TV is back for kids. No TV for the first 12 years. I think it's kind of interesting. I don't like it. I think it's just being less than us. But uh, anyway, when my kid you know, become a teenager, we can watch TV, and uh, he likes TV for some reason. And uh, he, he, he watched some documentary about someone using something called, um, I think I'll tell you, they use something to purify water so that it's too nice. They don't use this in So later I'll tell you how he came up with the idea and how we actually uh, move on to actually achieve the uh, concept. That project was also qualified for CSS and course. So it's his kind of thing. But I should tell you all these projects in the last three years. It's brand new. Right? So this is not like an old concept. Right? These, these are older, these are like four years ago. Right? So I want to tell you uh, he was watching TV, and uh, I don't know how many of you in Japanese school. Does anyone know something called NATO? You know what NATO is? Raise your hand if you do. Wow, impressive. All right. What is NATO? Do you know what NATO is? Fermented soybean. All right. You go to Japanese supermarket, you find some fermented soybean. And for those of you who eat it, you know what it looks like. It's very sticky. You create all these like the sticky spider web. There's a lot of herbs. Who is going to eat this? Well, uh, I have a different reason for you for you to, as to why you should eat it a lot. All right, it actually removes blood clot in your body. It actually prevents strokes. But I'm digressing. All right. Turns out you can extract a chemical out of uh, a natto. It's called PGA, polyglutamic acid. All right. You can extract the powder. If you put this powder into a uh, fishing pond or a swimming pool, they really cleans up the water. It's almost like a miracle. So my kids are said, wow, maybe I should use it to do water purification. So I oh, I really? Has it been done before? Does it really work? Does it looks like it's a clarifying the water. I'm not sure they're really purifying the water to a drinkable format and all that. So this is good though. So you have some chance that it might work. You have a reason why it might work. And also, it's new. No one has done a scientific study about PGA as a means to purify drinking water. So I like that concept. But later on, he also realized that, oh, there's something called chitosan. Like I said, it's made from exoskeletons of cracks and strings. These also reportedly have certain purification process also. But you know what? You could not find information about the dose in any published paper. So yet another thing you can add. So I, told, I was telling my kid, you want to do science fair project, you want to compare this with the industry standard at that time. So I said, yeah, so what is the industry standard? So I don't know. I'm not, in, I'm not a chemist. I'm not in the industry of purification. He looked it up. All right? He told me, yeah, people use activated carbon. People use a natural sealant to do purification. All right, then bring them in. You want to compare them. Does it make sense, right? So this is a natural step to why you want to do something. Not banana peel, not onion skins. You, have, you need a reason as to why you want to do something, right? Now later on, he also heard that there's some trees in Africa called Moringa trees. I don't know what they are, I don't care. But one thing I realized that you can buy the seeds from Amazon. Excellent. Alright? That means you can add a third thing for the comparison to that's how we build up this repertoire of what we want to compare in water to the project. The next step is, well, how do people measure these kind of things? You don't want to cook up with the idea how to measure things. But for example, years later, he want to do a, a solar cell research. I told him, well, look up in the literature, how do people measure the efficiency of solar cells? So oh, yeah, they are, they do a one sum measure. I said, what on earth is a one sum measure? He said it's a technical lighting setup that produces lights that's equivalent to like sun's intensity on Earth. All right, we don't. I don't own a sun, and uh, so I would not budget to build something. So yeah, you can explain to me. You said we are in high intensity light source, so we build, we wound up building that out of scratch. So, so lesson number one: we want to know how this kind of measurement is done in the industry. 
So like I said, what for filtering looks like people usually do, uh, uh, well, I don't, it wasn't a uh, canvas, I want to tell you, and uh, let me jump on slide here. People usually do something called ES law. That I'm not a canvas, I don't even know what ES law is. Turns out, the idea is that you go to some water untreated, you go to measure some lights passing through that liquid, and measure the absorption intensity. So you know the amount of chemical in the water. Later on, you treat the water with whatever kaitosan or PGA or whatever chemical you have, and then you measure again. You, come, you look at the ratio. The ratio tells you what percentage of the contaminants have been removed. So first of all, you need to study in that industry how do they measure this kind of performance. So and then I ask you, yeah, great, be a small. What equipment do I need to measure this so, so don't worry. It's high school has So this is nice. Turns out they use a central photometer. So, uh, at least in some high school, in public high school, they have such a But we actually wound up not using that. It's not maintained and all that. We wound up going to give it and buy a used one, actually. So that's okay, that's okay too. Right. So long as it's not expensive. Alright. I want to go back to earlier slides. Right. So then I asked him, so what kind of contaminants are you going to remove? Said, uh, wow, there's lots of toxic chemicals in drinking water. There are arsenic, there are cyanide, there are pharmaceuticals. I'm not going to, to get some cyanide for you to measure this kind of stuff. No, no, no. But we'll mimic it. This is an early stage. Remember, he was in, in ninth grade. In fact, I steal his slides from, from his slides four years ago. So, so I said, no, we cannot use toxic chemicals. So, how about we mimic the behavior? of those chemicals, right? So first of all, because we're going to use ES law to do the measurements, all these contaminants must be colored. They must have a color. All right, so yeah, find some colorful chemicals and tell me they are similar to your contaminants that you want to remove. So after a bunch of studies, yeah, first of all, we use potassium permanganate. This is not a chemistry class, don't worry. I won't go into details. They give you a red, white, red, purplish color. Perfect. So you can measure the complex negatively charged up anions like chromium oxide, for example. Right? And uh, what about organic contaminants? Well, how about food color? Go to Safeway, get some food color. Red, green, blue, and all that. I like those organic. They are not toxic. I hope not, because you're eating a lot of them every day. All right? So we're going to get some food color. And if you're good to remove food colors, chances are good to remove organic contaminants also. Right? So that's the idea. Right? And they said, okay, what about uh, transition metals? Copper, uh, nickel, that kind of metals. Right? Those are contaminants also. But that, you have no choice. So we wound up getting copper sulfate. Also. That actually is poisonous. Right? And then we also look at chlorines. Fluorines, chlorines, the halogen families also. So also, so we use some aldehyde or aldine solutions also. Right? I think there's a special name called the uh, Lugol solutions. Who am I? I don't know anything about chemistry. Right. And uh, anyway, we have two, uh, two kind of a uh, transition anion solutions. So uh, I will go through details. So we measure them. Uh, we also put in the turbidity measurement, which is to measure the air, how clear water is. And we did that because we remember watching some videos. We saw the, how we can use to 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 use PGA as a uh, purification. I don't want to go into any details. To show you, uh, we, well, the book has to do everything by hand in those days. Remember, I, I, at that time, I didn't really uh, uh, introduce because of automation measurements and all that. So every single point is measured multiple times. It's an average data point. And uh, my kid has to draw the graph by hand, kind of crude and all that. But it's a, you know, an early grade and ninth grade, you can win a trip to CSS already. All right, very very concept. And you might see summarize the, the result at the end uh, of this uh, slide. Right. So uh, we compare different kinds of contaminants, different kinds of uh, filtering, and we have the two controls. We have activated carbons, which by the way works really well for some, but not for everything. And CO light is really overrated. It's very cool. It's the poor, the poorest among all the chemicals that we uh, have been tested also. Right. All right. So that's about uh, physical science. So we look at chemistry, right? Uh, but, uh, so I want to mention the last.
topics because some kids are very hands on. They might want to build something, measure something. They don't mind getting a hands dirty, fingers glue together, glue and all that. There are kids like that. Like kids, it's, it's like that. He likes hands on project. Right? But some kids are different. They want to work, work on math, they work, want to work on computer science. They don't want to touch anything dirty. Because I, I can bang on the keyboard, I don't want to. I don't want to be hands on. There are kids like that too. So what are the topics these days that are popular among, uh, for science fairs, among math and computer science? Uh, some of you, in fact, I think a lot of you will know that will be deep learning projects. Right? Deep, lear deep learning is sort of like the elephant in, white elephant in the room. We don't talk about this, you're missing the point. If you do science fair, you must know there's a concept that's very popular. And we can look really in context these days. And that's deep learning concept. Right? And uh, so I think, uh, let me highlight a few of those contests. This usually be big prizes too. Right? Just, not just hands on project. Right? So uh, this is a great concept. Use deep learning to recognize cancer. Right? So uh, skin, this is a cancer, it's a mole and all that. So people use it to do detection of skin cancer using a neural network, deep learning concept. Right? And uh, looks like this is about, uh, I don't know, about uh, oh, uh, effectiveness of um, chemotherapy. So they, they have lots of data, they want to analyze the data. Uh, this is about um, natural language processing, All right. okay, the deep learning concept. Uh, this is about, looks like this is another, uh, basically a, a, a project where they look at lots of pictures and recognize the uh, occurrence of, uh, in this case, breast cancer, other than skin cancer. But what tell you? In case you're new to a deep learning concept, it's not about programming. Right? It's about data. Do you have access to this kind of high quality, let me emphasize, high quality data? Right? So it's very famous about deep learning. People give you like 6,000 pictures of cats and dogs and animals. Sometimes with no cats, no dogs. And we try to recognize, can you see what the cat is? So uh, you need lots of high quality pictures, not necessarily pictures, but in, in, the, in the projects here, it's very obvious that we can understand, oh, maybe I can use a machine, a training machine to recognize occurrence of cancers, rather than using a uh, technician to look at these pictures. Right. So I thought maybe I'll tell you what machine learning is. Machine learning is about using a generic algorithm that tells you something interesting about cell data and you don't have to write any code it's not like you have to write custom code but you train the data, you train the machine to recognize uh, maybe uh, occurrence of cancer in the examples right. so uh, in fact the most famous example of deep learning is to recognize handwriting right. so I think the first practice or homework you do in, in deep learning is that they will give you a, a lot of handwritten numbers one to one to nine, zero to nine and use a program to recognize the, the digits. Right? This is a classification uh, governance. Right? And you can think of it, well, you can easily use case studies to, uh, this is cancerous, this is not cancerous. Or maybe I look at the, your email, I know this is spam mail or this is not spam mail. Right? So you have a difficult to read here. And uh, some, one example people have is that, oh, I have a real estate agent. In this area, if you tell me how many bedrooms you have in your house, Square feet on your house, what neighborhood you're in, I will tell you the sales price, how much your house is worth. You can actually use deep learning to assign a price to your house, all right, so without bias. So how do you do this? Again, you train the, you, you train the your, your program with lots of data. Let me feed the program with lots and lots of high quality data and let the machine figure out, uh, minimize the error. This is really a regression process. So I, I will actually uh, look at all the data and let the program figure out, oh, then I should give you certain weight on this particular note, if you may, on any room. Okay, so I have a few pointers here. Research in many fields, uh, including linguistics, uh, over the last few decades has shown that generic learning algorithm can actually outperform approaches when real people are there to make the decision, to make the classification. So, in fact, it's kind of scary in some sense. They might, in the future, might trust a program more than a technician to recognize the occurrence of cancer cells. They might trust a machine more than a human. But that's just the nature of it. 
not that you should not be a technician about chemistry or something. And um, uh, the problem though, machine learning does have its disadvantage. Usually, even the developer who designs the uh, machine learning uh, uh, algorithm and all that, he himself or herself do not know how the machine come to the conclusion. Actually, that is scary. All right. So imagine years later, maybe not even years later, a few years later, in California prison system, they want everyone at time when the prison is up for parole. Uh, maybe they will look at your background and all that and say, well, I'm going to allow you to leave to, to be to leave the prison, or, or maybe I do not allow you. Maybe in the future they might use a program to decide whether you should or should not be released to the general public. The problem is that if they use a program to make a decision, they do not even know how does the program come to that conclusion. So it makes the prisoner very, makes it very difficult for prisoner to kind of like appeal in front of a judge. It's a normal, I think. I think you should you should allow me to leave because but they have, they have no reason to tell you why they do not allow you to be released to the public. That's a bit scary to me actually. But that might be a good science a science fair project about the fact that we do not know how a how a deep learning project comes to that conclusion. So here's the, the point I want to make about deep learning. Deep learning only works if the problem is actually solvable with data that you have. Right? Suppose you're calculating the house price of this neighborhood. It makes sense to give them parameters like number, number of rooms, the neighborhood, the square footage and all that. But maybe you just tell them, well, let me look at what house plants you have in the house. Can you predict what is the price of, of, the, of the house? That makes no sense. This is not something that's related directly to the house price. Right? So no matter how many data you flow at the deep learning algorithm, they will not come up with the correct algorithm. You will not come up with the right classification algorithm. So at least I see sometimes, I see people try to use deep learning app on everything. All right? In engineering, one idea is called a PID controller, proportional integral differential uh, integrator. Uh, you guys know what a segway is? You see a guy riding a segway in Cupertino. They try to shift the center of mass forward, and the PID controller under the cover, they try to roll the wheel to catch up with you so that your, your set of mass won't be falling over. That's how a segment works. Right? So typically, from an engineering perspective, you would design, really in an engineering approach, you design a PID controller, you tune your prompts and all that. But I noticed that some people are trying to use neural networks to solve that problem with deep learning. So now I don't do PID controllers, let me just throw a bunch of data, you may be the machine smart enough to know how to balance the machines. Now you, you can do that if you think that a human can make a judgment to decide how to balance the machine. If so, you have a chance in work using deep learning. If not, this is the wrong approach. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you whether it's right or wrong approach using deep learning to do a uh, segway uh, inverted pendulum uh, problem solution. But what I'll tell you, I've seen in some cases people applying some concept, applying a neural network or deep learning, to a problem where a human will not solve the problem better. And, you, and that's the wrong approach of applying deep, le deep learning to such a problem. So deep learning can be very complex. It's a simple linear relationship. Uh, you probably cannot read them just more. This is like the house price, this is the number of bedrooms, number of the footage of the rooms and all that. This assumes you have a linear dependency. So this time, this is called the weights of that particular node. So uh, you, this multiply this plus this multiply this, etc. come up with the output functions. All right? But sometimes the dependency on those input parameters are not linear. Then you have to break the data in multiple sets of data here, break it down into four sets. And this second node here will now become a hidden layer. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the meaning of a deep learning. Deep learning are hidden layers within your network for them to come to the conclusion. You're actually mimicking a non-linear non -linear coefficients on your model. Okay. So um, I won't go into details. That's how they recognize the handwritten numbers these days. Right? Uh, people write a letter A differently. Right? So this is kind of sloppy 8. 
uh, in the middle there. So you, you can actually put in a lot of number eights there, and uh, dig, uh, so we, we could digitize it into different levels. This is zero, this is one, this is uh, maybe 128, etc. So you fit these as your inputs. Remember with the hidden layers, hidden, this is what we meant by uh, deep learning. It seems to be a very accurate uh, learning process. These days, if you look at Google and you look at other, other commercial companies, they have the recognition, the accuracy rates all, almost always to be 95 plus percentage. So I like that because like I said earlier on, you can sort of use it to recognize cancer cells or whatever. You can use it to an analyze astrophysics data and all. I like that. If your kids are not a hands-on type, you might want to come, come up with some kind of a deep learning or mesh kind of approach. But in Springlight, and the purpose of this talk, we want to, I think Springlight wants to be aggressive, we want to try something new here. Uh, we thought it might be useful to uh, teach middle schoolers some lab techniques in terms when, when they're hands on. So um, I, I thought maybe I'll, I'll, I'll bring up a class that we want to bring up in, uh, in uh, Springlight starting soon. Actually, I think we might want, we want to do it in, in May or maybe uh, uh, early summer. Also. Right. So uh, I. I um, uh, in fact, it's not myself. I also uh, asked my kid to help me to design this class also. So uh, in fact, that's, that's why I steal some of these slides earlier on about the water field. Right? Uh, this class will have four parts. The first part I'll introduce the science research uh, uh, projects. I'll explain to the kids how to come with titles or topics. What are hard and not. More important, but I also ask them what to avoid. There's some projects you should not do because they are too easy, too simple, and they've done too many times. You won't be. So I'll tell you what to avoid also. And uh, I'll also... Uh, uh, now here's the difficult part. If a middle schooler wants to learn science fair and all that, A, it's very difficult for them to come up with a topic in two weeks. I shouldn't say it's difficult. How about impossible? Uh, it's almost impossible because they, will, they might have something too simple, or too difficult, like I want to do a nuclear power plant or something like that. It's either too difficult or, or impossible to do. Right? So I thought maybe uh, we, we better keep them a talk. Now, there are the pros and cons of this idea. If we keep them a topic, then they cannot use a topic in the actual science fair. Right? However, it's good because everyone is doing the same project, so I can help them. I can also make sure that they can do it. So what they learn is really the process of doing experiments, how to design. I give them some freedom about what they design, but I also want to help them to build instrumentation. Now, that is it. They, this is very ambitious. So I want to help them build instrumentation, and not some silly ones too. Right. For example, if you want to build a coil gun, so I want to shoot something over there, I want to see how, how effective it is. So you need to measure the speed of the projectile, you need to know how the range of the projectile. Right? You can do it unprofessionally. You can use a ruler to measure it. You can say, oh, I, I, I put a little box there, and I put little grids on the box. I see where the projector falls onto, like a ping pong ball. Based on where it falls on, I roughly have an idea what it is. You won't win any science fair. Too crude, too unprofessional. All right? I want to help your kid build some professional scientific instrumentation. I'll help your kid in the class. In fact, this is the second part of the of the part of the class here. I want to introduce Arduino, a single board computer with a programming interface. All right? So I'll teach the class about this, and I believe we can do this for middle schoolers also. All right? And uh, it basically amounts to you writing a few lines of code and understanding how to interface to an LCD panel, how to, how to configure sensors. So two light sensors, the tiny projectile pass three sensors is the transit time. I know the separation, I know the speed of your projectile. Make sense? If I give you a Hall effect sensor, you can measure the magnetic field. Maybe analyze the magnetic field generated out of certain currents. They can be very professional also. Furthermore, I, we can even automate the process so we log the data every, say, one millisecond into SD card. That gives you a huge amount of data to analyze something. Does that make sense to you? All right. So my intention is no, you're not going to use this class to come up with a project to enhance the process. Because it looks like no one will be able to come up with topics in two weeks. I'll give you the topic, everyone 
work on a variant of that topic. Mm -hmm. Not only work based on the same topic, but allows you freedom to make changes. For example, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you some link of a wire, ask you to make it into an image or magnet. Also make it the strongest you need. Make sense? All right. So you're allowed to move, you're allowed to coil around certain pipe or tubes, some diameter you design. You are allowed to insert ferrets within that structure also. And you can also measure the magnetic field professionally using a magnetometer which you build yourself. That makes sense to you. But this is very ambitious. Uh, we'll see whether you work out or not at the end. All right? So you'll notice that I, my intention is to interface to Arduino, to LEDs, SD card, LCD panel, and other physical sensors also. But if your kids really good, you say, oh, I, I can finish this in two days a month. Sure, why not? I will help you. Because you still come to class, I'll help you. To, if you really have a project you want to work on, maybe I want to work on my ILU unit. I want to build a... Uh, uh, a, a drone, for example. You can build your own drone also if you want to. All right? The third part of the week is after the instrumentation, you work on your project, which is a very simple minor project, just to get you into the habit of understanding the process. At the end, I will ask everyone to I will look at the look, let, let look book. I will ask to look at the, I will ask them to make the slides and present the data also. In fact, I will, I will invite some high school kids and all that to the class and to to listen to your talks and maybe give comments on this. Right. Hope that makes sense. All right. I won't go into details about this because I also uh, I don't think I have time. And I also want to talk about uh, uh, IoT. So I, I, I also work a lot on IoT concepts also. I, I don't want to go into details. So these are very good for engineering projects also. Right. So uh, you may not know if you're not in this, in this industry. There's now a very uh, inexpensive chip called an ESP8266. Uh, it allows you to very easily do machine-to-machine -machine communication. Okay. Uh, this itself is a microcontroller. Uh, this is, um, I think, made in Shanghai. Uh, this is <coughs> almost like a, a, a shock to this country, to the US. That uh, outside this country, someone's building a chip called a ESP8266, which allows you to do IoT projects with a cost of less than uh, three dollars, three US dollars. You can build, basically build a an array of sensors in your house if you want to collect all this kind of information temperature, pressure sensing data and all that in your house and communicate between machines and let the machines make the decisions or turn on the heaters, turn on the air conditioning and all that without any human intervention <coughs> but we will need that but that's not the intention you cannot read the slides I know, don't read the slides, read the slides too all right. now for those of you say at the end of this talk now if you say well I like it, I, like, I really think I should do science fair, but uh, uh, maybe I will take the class too. But uh, can, can I carry something about our online projects also? So you suppose you want to go all the way out to reach out to Stanford, to, to UC Santa Barbara and all that. There are research programs on in all those universities too, right? But we notice that if you just write a hundred emails to those professors, asking to collaborate with them, they said, who are you? Why should I work with you? All right. So the, at a minimum, you should understand that professor's research interest, at least with the abstracts of few papers that we published before you send it out. It's absolutely no. Okay. All right. You also have to give you already have some science research experience. So this class will give you a nice experience in learning the scientific process of, uh, of research. I do want to mention a few programs here, and one of the most prestigious. <coughs> Some of the program is actually the uh, RSI research program, some of you may know it's some of the program, but it's, uh, uh, there's, there's a condition, additional information here, um, and um, this is uh, run by MIT. Right. And, um, and, uh, and uh, for those of you who are doing math, some, some math students don't even, don't even like computer science course. Deep learning, that's not math. Yeah. They don't even like that course. They really want to do a math project, in the summer, there's a, usually a summer camp called the U.S. Uh, College uh, Promise, run at Boston University. For those, I know a lot of uh, math kids here. Uh, uh, try to uh, see if you can get into the Promise program. They will take about 60 students every year. It's a very prestigious program. All right? Of course, the uh, most um, kind of a prestigious math research program is now run also at MIT, known as the Prime uh, USA Prime, uh, Prime USA uh, program. It only takes about 15 to 20 students every year. Right? 
Uh, this is so, uh, I'll tell you if you get into this math research program, you're already in MIT. Because uh, Roman said that almost 100% of people are interested in this uh, Euro program in math research. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a guarantee to go to MIT already. Right? But unfortunately, this program is actually more difficult to get in than MIT is. So it doesn't seem to be an easy path for you to, to, uh, to boost your college ambitions. Right? Anyway, if you are doing math research, so, yeah. and, uh, and in fact, I, I, I skipped the slides here. Hope that, uh, I'm sorry, we probably cannot read the slides here. Another thing you can do is, uh, is to simply go to uh, those uh, summer research programs. There's one in, for example, Iowa. There's one in uh, Santa Barbara. There are a few programs here. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those programs, when you are like an eighth grade uh, middle schooler, you're not even uh, qualified to go to do summer, summer camps. But if you are nine or ten grades, if you don't want to do it yourself or you don't have a High school teachers are very supportive, or you don't want to take a class here, then uh, you might want to uh, go and spend some time in those summer programs in, uh, in those universities. But those are usually, um, uh, it, it depends on your, your teacher's recommendation letters, your GP, and all that too. It's not like they are not easy to get. But that's all. That's all I have. If you like. uh, thank you for long talk. Thank you for your attention. Sherry had her own schedule also, I thought it was very good.